Good morning, all of you. I just stand here to give a general introduction to the session. Actually, the third session in alumni conversations. So, instead of giving you an introduction to the resource person, I'll give you an introduction to the idea behind alumni conversations. Okay. The idea is this. Alumni obviously means those who sat in one of those benches that you are sitting, those who sat in one of those classrooms that you are sitting, those who were taught by some of the teachers that are teaching you. So when these people talk to you about what they have done with their life, what they have done to realize their dream, it will be more relatable to you. You will feel you will you that that feeling that uh, your dreams are indeed achievable will be strengthened, and that is the reason why we have alumni conversations. And today, as a resource person, we have Dr. Dilip Francis, who nourished his childhood dream of uh, researching and becoming a scientist while satisfying all the responsibilities expected of him. Without giving you further, without taking further uh, time, I'm going to invite Asma for a formal welcome. Honorable Principal, ma'am, respected teachers, and all my well and dear friends, a pleasant good morning to one and all present here. Today, on behalf of the outreach program, the album has decided to conduct a speech to be given and a workshop to be given by the distinguished alumnus, Dr. Dilip Francis. Our chief guest of the day has had over seven years of experience in the field of research and is a PhD holder, having graduated from Kannur University's Department of Microbiology and Biotechnology, and has conducted research regarding studies on antigens to develop vaccines. Dilip sir has also served as a coordinator and member of Center for Research at Krishna Jayanti College. He has conducted numerous workshops and seminars and is still evergreen for knowledge. He has continued to remain academically active during the past couple of years. Philippe, sir, it is, uh, it, it is an honor to have this gathering be graced with your presence. We would be delighted if you could share with us your words of wisdom and knowledge, and this would inspire us fellow diabetes to embark upon a journey as colorful as yours. So ladies and gentlemen, let's have a hand of applause to invite Philippe, sir, to have this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Uh, Dilip, sir, if you can give a rough introduction to the topic and talk to the students for some time, uh, uh -huh. so that I, uh, I can get the students to clear their doubts with you. All right, all right. So uh, I'll finish off my talk and then uh, we'll have an interactive session, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Okay, then uh, then that, sh that should be fine, right? Uh, so hello, everyone. Uh, good morning. Um, so you guys are sitting in a very familiar place. Uh, I mean, like uh, I've spent around. Um, you no, know, I uh, came to the the in 1990, um, KG, and then I I was there for uh, around nine years. Seventh standard. Uh, I was a hosteler. Uh, so basically, uh, you know, missing parents and stuff. And my brother too studied in Dayapuram. Uh, he was three years senior to me. And uh, my brother left after 10th standard. So uh, I felt kind of lonely uh, out there. And then so I moved to a school um, in my place. Uh, but then I I would say I have, um, this was my, Diabram was my uh, first home. Um, normally we say school is our second home. For me, it was my first home because I was a hostler, mostly That's the reason and mm, kind of connection uh, that uh, most of us, most of alum, most of us alumni share with Diabram uh, is very nostalgic and emotional. Uh, when Jodimus uh, called me up for a, um, uh, I mean, um, you know, inviting me for this talk, this is what I told her. Even to Adil sir, this is what I told her because coming back to Diabram. Uh, always an enriching experience. Uh, you know, it actually uh, is getting back to your home. And uh, 
Um, in between, uh, after I submitted my PhD thesis, uh, I had worked in Diabram for one year. So most of your teachers, um, I know them personally. Um, I, I, I taught biology for one year while my PhD thesis was being evaluated. And then later I moved to the college where I work now. So um, it's really an honor and a privilege to be back uh, to the place where uh, I belong to. I always have um, connected myself with Diabram uh, in sort of very uh, emotional way. So this is indeed a pleasure and uh, also an honor actually to be back here. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, I'm not technically a scientist. I'm an academician basically, uh, because I, I do teaching uh, along with research. Uh, so uh, this, this kind of a talk uh, is basically to, um, to tell you about careers that are not generally considered as mainstream careers. Uh, I'm, I'm pretty sure most of you uh, would want to clear uh, the NEET exam or uh, maybe the uh, JAM or uh, some, some kind of that those sort of exams and get into engineering or medicine. I'm sure most of you are planning to do that. How many of you are planning to do that? How many of you have prioritized getting into a medicine a medicine course or engineering course as your prior, I mean, your, your goal? Can you raise your hands? Oh, yeah, you, you cannot, yeah. I see one hand coming up, that's it. Basically others have not planned on what is what you're going to do. Okay, great, great. So uh, maybe my assumption is wrong. Uh, some of you have thought of alternative careers as well. Oh, yeah, that's great. Um, so I just wanted to you know, uh, see uh, when when I was in my um, uh, school days, the, the LKG, UKG uh, classes, and all that. Teachers asked this first fundamental question: is when, uh, what do you want to become? When my son has faced this question n number of times. He doesn't have an idea of what is like, he doesn't even know what is like becoming someone. He's a baby, he's a kid. He knows that he's a kid, but he doesn't know that he's going to grow up and then become something and the society wants him to become something. When this question comes to us, I've, I've heard um, many of my classmates without even knowing what, what this aspiration is like. Uh, many of them answered, of yeah, I want to become a scientist. I'm pretty sure some of you, or maybe many of you, um, had given the same answer when your your kindergarten teacher asked you this question, right? But then uh, no, among the most popular answers that pop out, one is like I want to become a doctor. Um, mostly people don't. I mean, kids don't um, aspire to become engineers, but uh, maybe that's that's kind of. It's not a fancy thing. Uh, and some of them would like to become policemen. Fire engineers is kind of a crazy thing for kids. Uh, and, 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 and a large bunch of kids aspire to become scientists. As they grow up, you know, uh, this scientist group uh, gradually, you know, and if, if if that actually was their dream or it, it, it was just a, an answer to a question that was uh, asked to them. Somehow we forget this career option. Generally, we appreciate scientists, we respect them, and we don't think of how to become one. How do we actually become a scientist? What does a scientist actually do? So I thought, uh, since I'm partly into this kind of a business, although, although I told you I don't do um, hardcore research because I'm partly into teaching and partly into research. Um, uh, I would say I'm a 50% I'm a scientist and 50% teacher, or maybe 60% scientist, sorry, teacher and 40% scientist. How do you become a scientist, a full-fledged scientist? And what is expected from a scientist? What, what do you do as a scientist? Um, and uh, the, the, the background, uh, as I already told you, you don't identify Becoming a, becoming a scientist or a academician uh, as a career option. Uh, and we don't, we don't tell our students budding, uh, you know, youth that this also is a career option. This is actually 
I would say the best career anyone can have, the most rewarding, um, satisfying career anyone can have. And, and this is the best possible way you can serve humanity. Uh, because, you know, um, I'll just take an example before I move into my technical presentation. Um, we had the pandemic running for three years, uh, almost two years now. Nine, um, uh, 2019, uh, December, we had the first report from Wuhan, it's a province in China. We were quite unprepared. We didn't, we didn't expect this coming, but then it happened. And we went into sort of, you know, um, an emergency kind of situation, uh, but we are out of it now. I, I would confidently say uh, we are out of it because uh, papers are coming, um, you know, research articles are coming, which says that the pandemic is over. That's good news. So such um, big uh, difficulty that humanity faced, we were able to uh, come out of it in, in, in a matter of two years. Uh, and then the most important uh, you know, contributions were made by scientists, I would say. We were able to diagnose the disease. I mean, we developed a diagnostic modality. We, we, we call it RT-PCR and stuff, but what goes inside us all scientific contributions. People discovered these kind of things and then and, and that was put to use. We sequenced the genome of uh, SARS-CoV-2. We understood the biology of it. We developed a vaccine. And vaccines are what changed the scenario. Now around 500 crore, uh, Individuals have been vac uh, vaccinated completely, vac at least partly vaccinated. And who's, who did this? You know, uh, we see doctors coming uh, on the media platform, sitting and discussing stuff. You never see a scientist who's working behind the screen uh, in, 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 a, in a lab, you know, mixing things and trying to figure out what would work and what would not work. Ultimately publishing his paper telling that this MIR and mRNA vaccine is going to save humanity. And then some company takes it, takes the idea and builds a vaccine and gives it to a doctor and the doctor administers it. Basically, it came from a lab. It came uh, from a person's or, or a group of people's support. It came from the knowledge that humanity developed over the course of years. And all this was done by scientists. And that's why I told you best way to serve humanity, best way to be a, a socially inclined person is by becoming a scientist. And, and don't think that scientists generally, we, I mean, uh, uh, throughout my talk, I'll be referring to scientists in terms of a, um, um, a science person. You can be social scientist. You have, you, you know, uh, Ashley Sir uh, is a social scientist. You have scientists, and you can be a scientist, you can be a, a philosopher in any, any sort of field. But uh, for some reason, we don't recognize this as a career. Of course, it's not a lucrative career. I would say that right in the beginning. Uh, Monetary-wise, it's, it's not a very pleasing career. I'll come to that in detail towards the end. Uh, but the nobility-wise, uh, you know, uh, if you are your pursuit is happiness, if your pursuit is satisfaction, then this is your this is the best of uh, you know all possible careers around. Okay, so my talk is basically going to be yeah uh, I I do not want to tell I mean I towards the end I'll tell you what exactly I do and what is my research all about uh, and why um, uh, and things like that. So I, I'll take you through a very brief presentation on. Uh, how do you become a scientist? And what does it like to be a scientist? What do scientists actually do? I, as I told you, I'll be mostly referring to science and technology as in you know, um, engineering, science, technology, math and stuff, uh, and, and what scientists in this, these domains do. Of course, don't forget, you can be a social scientist, you can be an economic uh, a scientist in um, you know, economics, you can, you can be a scientist in any field. I'll be restricting my discussion to science and its elite disciplines, okay? So I'll share my screen, uh, right? So this is, uh, uh, this is going to be a very brief presentation. I'll try to cover almost uh, everything, yeah. 
Uh, is my slide visible? Uh, just, just raise your hands and, and show me some gestures. Yeah, okay, fine, good, great. Right. So, um, right. I already told you this is this is what we're going to discuss. What do scientists do? Who is this person here? Yeah, it's it's Albert Einstein. You know, you all know him. So, uh, uh, okay. Uh, what do scientists do? What do they actually do? What, what does what does that they do? See, this this is why you know most of us dream of becoming a scientist one day. And later, we drop this dream uh, and take up a career which is uh, which is uh, you know more popular in terms of um, your your parents' acceptability and stuff like that. The most important reason is we don't know what actually a scientist do. It's a fancy term for us. It's a fictitious term for us. For, for most of us, we don't exactly know what a scientist do. We have not seen scientists, actual scientists, um, apart from, apart from uh, you know, in those movies, in those fancy fictitious movies. Um, so uh, and then you, how do you become one scientist? How do you become a scientist? That's a big, big question. If, if okay, for example, if I, I am successful in motivating you guys to become a scientist by the end of this talk, then, uh, the next obvious question is right: How do you pick? How do you become one? How do you pick up a career in um, a science? The in, in science as a scientist. Okay, why is it an attractive career? So, sorry for the typo there. Yeah, why is it an attractive career? So this uh, this is why I told you I wanted it to be interactive. Um, you see three people there, right? You see three, uh, three phases on the screen. So actually, we're not able to view the different slides. It's Is it so? Yeah, okay, maybe I will have to go back and then. Um, do you see my slide now? Yes, sir. Okay, so somebody is. Um, uh, oh, oh, all right. Um, uh, who are these people? Who is this? The first person, handsome young man, not young now. Who is this? Yeah. Okay, who's the second person? Everyone knows some, right? Okay. Um, this is Brad Pitt, you know Brad Pitt, right? And this is Sachin Tendulkar, the, the god of Indian cricket. That's how it's um, known as, yeah? This is Sir Isaac Newton. So my question is, thousand years from now, this is just a, a, you know, just to tell you what, uh, why is it important to become a scientist, yeah? So in 3022, that is 1,000 years from now, we don't even know if humanity, uh, you know, how, how, uh, how humanity is going to look like in, 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 in 1,000 years from now. My question is, whose legacy is going to be remembered? Okay, what, what I'll do is you can raise your hands. Um, how many of you think that Brad Pitt's legacy will still be remembered after 1,000 years? On Sachin Tendulkar's legacy, there'll be some fans of Sachin Tendulkar. I, I expected that. Okay, very good. Well, and Sir Isaac Newton's legacy. Over now. Yeah, we will be a little. We will be a little hesitant to tell this because we like Brad Pitt and Sachin Tendulkar more than Isaac Newton because he's the guy you uh, who introduced this classical physics and uh, you know, the Newtonian motion and stuff, it's pretty difficult for us to study. But still, I would say after a thousand years of humanity is still in the same form uh, and the st same structure okay, with minor modifications. The legacy of Isaac Newton is, uh, is, this is what, this is very personal, but this is what I feel. It's a legacy of Isaac Newton that is going to be carried forward. We don't remember theaters, the theater actors in 1850s although there are documented records on better actors in 1800s, but we don't remember, we don't know anybody's name. 
Uh, Sir Isaac Newton lived in 1700s and 1800s, and we, we still know his name. We still teach him. We still study about him. Or his equations are still valid. So this is the legacy that is carried forward by a scientist. So, and Diabodum is a place which has you know, created a lot of doctors, a lot of engineers. I, most of my classmates, I would say around 30, 40% of my classmates are doctors in some way. Like they, some of them are MBPAs and MD doctors. Some of them are dental doctors. And a large group of them are actually, uh, you know, uh, engineers. So, uh, but, but, um, having said that, the legacy of a scientist, you know, gets carried over uh, time and then uh, till humanity exists, the legacy will be there. Why don't we opt to become uh, scientists? The simple, uh, that's a simple proposition I'm putting forward. Yeah, okay, then um, did my slide change? Okay. What do scientists do? Okay, this, um, I'm sure this, uh, uh, the chapter six molecular basis of inheritance. Uh, I hope most of you are, I mean, all of you are studying biology, right? This is from your NCRT textbook. I'm pretty sure some of you have seen this, right? How does this information come in there, right? We're looking at what scientists do. How does this information come in? You've studied a lot of stuff, right? You have studied, uh, you know, fertilization in plants, fertilization in human beings. You're studying biotechnology, you're studying environmental issues and stuff like that. And, uh, and, and somebody has written this uh, as though it's very authentic uh, and, and you trust that, you believe that it's right. Okay? Just because your teacher reads the book or, or she, he or she explains this, you believe that it's right. But how did these facts come into the textbook? Where did you get this information from? In the molecular basis of inheritance, teacher says that the DNA is a double helix. Yeah, wonderful. Let's say she says that it has two polynucleotide chains which run anti-parallel to each other. And adenine pay, pairs with thymine, guanine pairs with cytosine. The most uh, rebellious student, even the most rebellious student in the class doesn't, uh, you know, ask a question. Um, why can't, I mean, why are you so sure? Why did this information come into the NCRT textbook? It comes from what is called as you know, scientific publications, research articles. And uh, if you ask me, a scientist, <laughs> what he does is he publish articles. He doesn't publish articles just like that. He has to do a lot of things before that. Ultimately, how he lets the world know that I have found out something, the discovery part. This is what if we've all, 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 all heard about scientists, they discover things. What do they discover things? It's, it needn't always be a, a tank, tangible, uh, you know, a, a substance sort of things, a fancy chemical. No, not always. If you contribute something to the existing knowledge pool, that becomes a discovery. This is some uh, a very important home message uh, that you all have to realize. It's, it's not discovering something new, but discovering a species as such or discovering a tool, a, a, a machine. This is not everything, I mean, this is not that uh, scientists, uh, I mean, scientists do a lot more than that. Scientists actually contribute to the knowledge pool of humanity. We know certain things about how the natural world works, how, um, you know, organisms reproduce. We know certain things about if, uh, how cells, you know, take substances from the uh, outside. We, we know, uh, a lot of things about uh, how photosynthesis happens. And how did we get this knowledge? This knowledge that got into textbooks and is teached or taught worldwide as accepted facts. How did it come into textbooks? There were scientists behind that. There were people who you know, toiled hard in the lab behind that. And this, this on, on the right of your book chapter, uh, what you see is the paper that was published by James Watson, James T. Watson and Francis S. Crick in 1954 or 53. This was published in a magazine, in a science magazine called as Nature. Okay. Nature is a big magazine. I'll, I'll show you the website of Nature if time permits towards the end. And uh, this was what uh, Watson told in 1953 to the world. We wish to suggest structure 
for the salt of deoxyribonucleic acid. The structure has novel features which are of considerable biological interest. And in 1953, James Watson published his findings in Nature. And now you see them in textbooks. And this is what exactly a scientist do. He identifies a biological problem or a scientific problem, a problem in physics, a problem in math, and then he tries hard to find a solution for the, for the problem. I'll just I'll I'll talk about how um, a problem is solved also. But then this is how what they do. And once they feel that they have solved it a little bit, they publish it. They let the world know by writing a paper. This is this is the jargon is paper. It's technically called a manuscript. Manuscript, and, and, and it's not like you just send something into a, a journal like Nature and it gets accepted. No, they send it to um, reviewers, people who will look into the work that the person has done, and they'll find out whether work has followed the method of science. Okay, There's, a, there's something called as a method of science. I'll, I'll not go into such technicalities. Then once they find that, okay, standard uh, procedures have been followed and the result that has been presented is valid. It comes out as a publication. And this was a landmark publication. You know this. Um, James Watson um, and uh, Crick, for, you know, Francis Crick, they got a Nobel Prize for this discovery. And this revolutionized biology forever. This is how everything came into existence, modern biotechnology, uh, no the omics technologies. You might not have heard about omics technologies. But then uh, personalized medicine. Everything came after this discovery by James T. Watson. And people, there are more people behind this work. There is a lady called as Sally Franklin, um, who's who was actually not edited for this work uh, because of. Lot of reasons, but later people understood that Rosalind Franklin had also contributed to this work and she was credited, duly credited. So this is what this is what scientists do. They generate knowledge. And what do you think? Like uh, 10 years from now or 15 years from now, if you enter the pursuit of generating knowledge for humanity, generating valuable knowledge, why is this valuable is a big question. Of, of course, James D. Watson didn't die a billionaire. I, I, I would say that. I, I have to stress on that. He was not a billionaire when he died. And Francis Crick was not a billionaire when he died. They have left a proud legacy that will be remembered as long as humanity exists. Right? Uh, for the discovery of DNA, nobody paid money to James D. Watson. The government funded it probably. But then um, the way he has contributed to humanity is uh, you know, there's no comparison for that. Okay. Now uh, I have a problem. Uh, is my slide changing? All right. Yeah. Okay. And now, why is this knowledge important? Why is this knowledge important, guys? Knowledge is important because knowledge begets applications. How? What I've shown here is this is uh, about this is a paper which was published in a journal called as New England Journal of Medicine. This is another magazine which publishes the work of scientists. And uh, what you see here is a article that came during the COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, for me personally, this this paper was kind of a, a soothing paper because. Uh, this paper for the first time proclaimed that the mRNA vaccine that Pfizer was later coming up was effective against SARS-CoV-2. This is what we read in uh, you know, all our online newspapers, all, all our newspapers that reported this. Uh, mRNA-based vaccines have been found effective against the COVID-19 virus. And, 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 and that knowledge that scientists developed translated to this. You see on the right is a graph that shows the number of individuals who have been vaccinated so far. You see it, it has reached the 500 crore mark. So this came from a lab. Of course, um, um, uh, it, it, it's, not, it's not as, as simple as that. Uh, you know, Crores of rupees would have gone into the trial 
A lot of effort has gone into the trial. This simple piece of paper that a group of scientists published ultimately saved humanity from the crisis of the pandemic. This is, this is what scientists do. You, know, you don't see them coming, coming on uh, media discussions. I mean, I've, I've, I've personally um, um, asked this question. Like, I've wonder, I, I was wondering, like, people come and talk about vaccines. Doctors come and sit and talk about uh, vaccines volumes together uh, as if they've discovered it. But, you know, actually speaking, in India, we have a lot of people working on vaccines, viral vaccines, for years together. There's a National Institute of Immunology in Delhi. There is a virology center in Manipal. There are a lot of scientists who are working towards it, but now none of them were called uh, and uh, asked an opinion about how these vaccines are going to work. How is the pandemic progressing? The reason is we don't understand how things work. It was not a physician. It was not a doctor who sat and discovered the vaccine. It is not his or her work that contributed to the development of vaccine. It was people who wear lab coats and sit and work in labs who discovered it. And the dosage was optimized by scientists again. Maybe they would have taken help from doctors. Of course, I'm not, I'm not like uh, uh, under, undermining any career. But then you aspire to become doctors and you find that is a noble profession. Why can't you aspire to become scientists who contribute to the the doctor's practices. Don't you think it's 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 uh, it's worth it, right? And then, uh, how do you become a scientist? Is the next question, right? Uh, for that, let me give you some idea of. Uh, do you see see my slide? Yeah, this is technical stuff. Not so very interesting. But what do they do? They identify a problem. What is a problem? A problem is like when the pandemic had hit humanity hard, we didn't have anything to resist the pathogen. It was spreading like anything. People were uh, you know, suffering because of the quarantine and other kind of uh, restrictions imposed upon them. They were sitting at home. I mean, everyone, everyone of us faced the um, aftermaths of the pandemic. The, yeah, so um, we had to face the challenge. The, the problem was we didn't have any therapeutic options. Whatever therapeutics were used were kind of you know, based on here, say probably the hydroxychloroquine and stuff like that. And we wanted a, a therapeutic, a prophylactic, a vaccine. Yeah. So that was a problem. And then what do scientists do? When they have a problem, they formulate a hypothesis. They, they look into the problem in depth and then they, they figure out a possible solution for the problem. Okay, if I do this or if 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 this is a, this is a possible way of solving the problem, that's a hypothesis. And then later they test the hypothesis. That is where they get into the lab and do all these experiments. They do a lot of experiments, prove or either disprove their hypothesis, their, their take on it, their stand on it. They'll, they'll try to figure out whether what they've thought about the problem, what they've thought about the as a possible solution for the problem, is it right or is it wrong? And then ultimately they get a lot of results. They look into the results. And once they find that it's it's not, you know, uh, some sometimes they'll find that the hypothesis is valid, it is proven. That means they have solved the problem to an extent. If, if they find that it's that the experiment results of the experiments prove otherwise, then they failed to justify their hypothesis. In either cases, they have the option of publishing. They can tell the world that, uh, that we addressed this problem, we created this sort of a hypothesis. We tested the hypothesis using these kind of um, experiments. These are the results that we got. And, 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 and in the end, they, they, they conclude by telling that, okay, we, our, our hypothesis stands proven. And they contribute a little piece of knowledge to the humanity. It gets recorded. The 1953 paper I showed was published by <clears throat> James D. Watson. 
Excuse me. It gets recorded. This is what they do. But then what actually do they uh, what they do is they write proposals. All this requires money, guys. So I'm coming into the business of being a scientist. Or maybe, um, how, do you, how do you do it, actually? You have a wonderful idea. <clears throat> you, you're going to solve the problem of um, getting into space. Like Elon Musk is doing a lot of things on that, right? He has money. When you decide to work on something, you need resources, right? You need money. You need to have a lab. All this is done on sophisticated experiments, robotics and stuff. How do you put in uh, money? Who gives money for this? Government funds, okay. You Governments, every government allocates a big amount for science and technology development every year in their annual budget. If you look at the US budget, a big portion of it goes for medicine and uh, related disciplines, research conducted on medicine and related disciplines. How do you get it? How do a scientist get it? Scientists will have to write a proposal telling that, okay, I'm looking at a problem. I have a solution for that. So this is what I'm going to do. You fund me. You send this across to a funding agency. We call that a funding agency. Uh, funding agencies are actually a nightmare for most of the working scientists because funding agencies, <laughs> you know, it's, it's very difficult to convince a funding agency and get money. And you propose that my entire work requires around two crore rupees. Funding agency will give it to people who are experts in the field. They'll evaluate your proposal. You'll see if it is viable. You'll also see if you have expertise to do this. That is very important. That is what distinguishes you as a scientist, you can you can make an a n number of claims. You can tell that I'll do this, that. But then they'll evaluate your credentials. They'll check out whether you have the potency or you have the capacity to carry out the research. That's developing the skills. I'll come to that. That is how to become a scientist who's capable of doing proposals, writing proposals and getting fund. And once you get funds, you do the research. Once you become a full-fledged research, you, you hardly get into apps because you will have a lot of people working under you. You can ask money for paying your employees. You can put people under you, junior research fellows, senior research fellows. And then ultimately, after they finish, your, finish their work, you will be their guide and they'll be getting a PhD. So most of the scientific labs, if you go to the supervisor, that is a person who wrote proposal, um, God funds will be sitting in an AC chamber, giving instructions to a lot of students who will be working in the lab. And, you know, ultimately, the fund is sanctioned, people work on it. And ultimately, you write a manuscript, one or two or three, a single project will maybe get, uh, you know, help get, um, help you to get a lot of publications. You can apply for patents. Right. Yeah. So most of the time, see, for me, myself, the last three months, four months, I've been writing around four, four papers. Most of the time, I mean, apart from what I do in my college, most of the time I spend on writing papers, writing papers. So some of you uh, have realized by this time that you're good at writing, good at technical writing. You write good essays. You're creative in, in, in uh, you know, writing stuff. Scientist is a, a job that will help you to utilize your creativity in writing. Because generally, when we when we identify students in schools, with the capacity to the capacity to you know write essays and stuff, we we try to channel them into literature and humanities kind of courses. Actually, getting your work published. A journal requires a lot of writing skills. You should be very creative while writing, right? So, um, how do you become a scientist? Is the next question, right? I've already told you what a scientist does. Yeah, he solves problems for humanity. He creates knowledge, new knowledge, which others apply and create products. 
very good nice how do you become one right what you see here is um, can anyone tell me which institute this is uh, can someone circulate the mic stanford no no i purposefully kept uh, institutions from abroad here um, because so india it has a lot of very good really good in institutions stanford of course is big it's not stanford this is this is in india anyone else would like to try uh this features in the top 5 universities top 10 universities of the world delhi university or delhi university good try i'll give you a clue this is in bangalore i iasc bangalore very good it is iasc bangalore indian institute of science bangalore okay it was once uh, known as the tata institute now it is iasc iasc is actually um, a really good place okay i mean at par with stanford and places like i mean we we generally tend uh, to disagree with all this but um, i know this place personally so i would say this is at par with although it doesn't look as posh as stanford and other places uh, they do really good research okay in science and technology okay so the question is how do you get into this institute it's not easy guys um iisc is very difficult to get in now again i'll i'll tell you there are a lot of such really good institutes in india most of us don't know that these institutes exist That's why I I wanted you guys to answer this question. This is IIC Bangalore. Then you have Tata Institute of Fundamental Res uh, Research in um, Delhi. You have National Brain Research Institute. You have a lot of very good, very you know places uh, uh, which have had a great impact on world science. Uh, you know, in 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 the domain of world science uh, is in India. All right, uh, IIC was known as the mecca of biochemistry uh, once. Now nobody uses that epithet, but it was once known as the mecca of biochemistry. A lot of great biochemists uh, across the globe used to visit the biochemistry department of IIC. Okay. But now they rank in the top ten universities of the world. But the question is, how do you get into it? How do you get into uh these kind of places right um, i actually am facing a problem with my slide changes sorry for the inconvenience um i have to go back to the uh go back and get each slide and then display it uh, maybe it's a problem with my zoom i have not updated it for a while now okay so how do you become a scientist first part is be motivated guys if you don't have motivation please don't go for all this because you will you will realize that it's not an easy job later on and then you'll quit so and what basically i am doing doing is this is the first part to put you in that motivation track okay first and and, and i i will admit i was not i mean i never dreamt of becoming a scientist that's why i told you i'm a i'm a i'm, I'm, a, I'm an academician by accident uh, i took a subject biotechnology which was biotechnology um, had i mean i i i was i was interested in biotechnology uh, and then I, i i went for biotechnology looking for an industrial job later i realized that this this particular domain uh, biotechnology is more into research and research related careers that's how i ended up in the academia i never uh, dreamt of becoming a, an academician uh, to be very frank but, but um, uh, the abram had um, uh, given me a lot of opportunities i used to be an orator um, i i I've gone to places to take part in you know speech competitions and stuff so i basically like to talk um i i like to give speeches and stuff uh, so academics sort of um, you know suits me so i am happy with the profession uh, but uh, what i've lately realized is if you if you, you know inspire students take up this career right uh, you know at this stage like when they're coming out of their schools uh probably you will get you know 
lot of scientists, the scientists coming out in the country in the coming um, years, right? So first thing is be motivated. How do you how do you how do you get motivated? As you listen to this kind of talks, now you're getting a lot of idea of what scientists basically do. Okay, and think whether your skill sets, whatever you have now, uh, uh, skill sets are suitable for taking up a career in, in uh, this this particular domain. And then you choose your domain because now you 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 are um, studying everything. You study math, you study biology, you study physics, you study chemistry. But I'm I'm sure you would have developed a liking to a certain subject and 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 a disliking to a certain subject for for many reasons. See if that uh, liking and disliking is objective enough to choose a domain. If you feel that, okay, um, I like chemistry, I like physics, or maybe I like math, then uh, try to figure out the reasons for that um, uh, you know, uh, passion. Uh, and then if, 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 it is, if you find that the passion is true, then maybe you can fix that as your domain. Second thing is, next thing is you have to Finish your graduation, UG, that is BSc, and then your MSc. As I told you, I'm talking about science. If if, if just engineering, uh, you will have to finish your PG. Post graduation is a mandatory requirement to get into PhD. I'll come to PhD. So once you're done the, with this, and and if you decide on this kind sort of a career right now, choose a very good institute, a very good place to. Learn the basics because you're learning the basics not to get into an industry, but to apply this to your research later on. So that means you have to get into an institute like IIC. Most of these, these uh, central government institutes, na national institutes, they don't offer uh, undergraduate courses. Undergraduate courses, you can do it anywhere, uh, uh, any place which, which has a good reputation. And then for PG, you can actually think of research centers. I'll come to that. Um, okay. Once you finish your PG, you start with your research. How do you start with your research? You have to make a small contribution, the existing, for example, you decided to go with math, you studied your BSc in mathematics, MSc in mathematics, uh, and then you have to enroll for a PhD, right? I'll tell you, unlike what most of us think, PG, your MSc, you pay the institution for doing the course in the program. For PhD, um, you know, recent times we've, uh, we've seen a lot of private universities offering PhDs, but guys, uh, world over, PhD is not something that you get by paying fees. Instead, PhD is done by taking government money. Government funds you. For example, I um, was paid around 10, lakhs, like right? around 12 lakhs during the course of my PhD as my remuneration, right? You need not pay anything to the institution. For example, if you're doing it in Indian Institute of Science or a state university or a central university, you need not pay anything. The, the university or the research institute will pay you. There are a lot of exams which you know, qualifies you to get these fellowships. I qualified what is called as CSIR JRF, that is the Council for Scientific and Industrial Research in India. It is basically a funding agency. Every year, two times, they conduct exams for this postgraduate. After you finish MSc, you can take your take this exam. They conduct it in four fields. One is life sciences, that is biological sciences. Second one is chemistry, Third one is math, and then fourth one is um, you know, environment and other, other domains. If you clear this exam and if you feature in around say 150 ranks, uh, first 150 or 200 ranks in the country, the central government now now the fellowship amount is actually around 41,000 per month. If you're doing it in Bangalore, 41,000 per month is actually you can you can around say support your family with that money, right? And you you're doing your PhD. So keep this in mind, PhD. It's not something that you pay money and get, or pay fee and do the program, no. You're actually contributing to the knowledge pool. Humanity knows that, the governments know that. The government funds you. You have to prove that you have content, you have stuff in you. You have to take up exams, a lot of exams are there, especially uh, women in science is kind of a upcoming concept. So 
women especially gets a lot of um, fellowship opportunities and then if you do your phd you will be mentored there will be a guide for you i told you somebody who went through all these procedures and have already become a scientist will be mentoring you or an academician will be mentoring you you will finish your phd and submit what is called as a phd thesis the thesis is your first small contribution to the knowledge pool the particular domain that you have chosen for example if chosen math you will be contributing some a little bit of knowledge enhancement your contribution if the contribution is found valid it will be evaluated if your contribution is original if your contribution is worthwhile if your contribution was made by following the method of science if the evaluating body is convinced then they confer it's not uh, uh, they confer the degree of phd uh, on you first step to becoming a scientist is that enough no not at all problem is with just a phd uh, no funding agency is going to trust you and give you funds to do independent research as i, as I told you once you get a phd have the degree then if you want to become an independent scientist and contribute to your domain you will have to write proposals you will have to gather funds and uh, things like that right for that you have to get uh, yourself trained further and these are the opportunities you can do what is called as pdf not the portable document format it's post doctoral fellowship um in india if you do it in a good uh, research institute like indian institute of science i have seen most of my friends who did phd from isc or such national institutes they move to places like stanford cambridge big places and they work with nobel laureates people who have um, who have published a lot and all that again you are funded by the government your travel your stay abroad all your expenses are taken care of get a handful of remuneration and that this is the second uh, stage of training in doing your post doctoral fellowship you getting you 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 get yourself trained uh, become a expert in the domain and once you finish that you're good enough to start writing proposals running your own projects and getting into an academic session until now like when you're doing your phd you're doing your pdf nobody is going to offer you a permanent academic position academic position as in you have to enroll into a teaching department in a college or a university or you can you can enroll as a scientist uh, a research institute and then you can start your own lab you can start uh, writing proposals you can start gathering funds and you can you know start your journey of uh, being a scientist and by the time you retire maybe uh, you can contribute significantly to a particular domain uh, a very specific domain you know people work on fancy things like you know, how uh, apples brown and they are cut you won't believe me this is this is a this is a per, this is the pursuit some 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 scientists do they try to they, they spend a lifetime on identifying molecules that are responsible for uh, making apples brown and they are cut you won't believe this but it's very important why because when you identify why apples brown when they are cut we can come with remedies we can stop browning maybe a person who spends 50 years on that he dies off and then uh, uh, the, no after after he's no more a company comes up with a product based on his contributions right uh, so this is this is how you, you know get to become an ind independent researcher so my point is my take home message is don't be averse to taking a, a pure science subject for your undergraduate and post graduation thinking that it doesn't give you um, um satisfactory career later on 
his career is always there be very focused and serious when you decide to become a scientist do your graduation and undergraduation with enough seriousness don't take it light read and learn as much as possible and then get your phd start your journey in becoming a scientist but why this this is one question that <clears throat> the youth tend to um ask why why do i why do i become a scientist to build knowledge not a single for others to apply I mean, it's happy there <laughs> again a typo for others to apply to serve humanity more than anybody else does scientists who discovered the mrna vaccine which pfizer marketed the knowledge that was there existing actually helped humanity most during the pandemic right what i have felt is you understand life better when you are a scientist you understand life way better than anyone else when i don't know uh, uh, especially when you go into this pure sciences physics biology chemistry and math any, any scientific pursuit is basically about understanding life living organisms and the nature when you yourself um become a scientist i have always felt this that's have that's what what's the reason why i have put it there you always feel that you understand life better but i mean there is no point in understanding life better it's just kind of a philosophical advantage but then um, i feel that's worth it yeah and you are your boss independent researchers the only liability they have is to funding agencies uh, as far as i know is funding agencies will ask for progress reports after 3 years of giving the money what is the progress in your research what have you come up with basically you are your boss right there you run your own lab you have your students you have your reagents you have your chemicals you have the facilities nobody is giving you deadlines yeah except the funding agency you are your boss you travel the world with somebody else, with, with with the tax money i would say See, I have a friend. He's in Cambridge now. He's traveled around twelve uh, countries to give presentations, conferences, and all his travel is funded by the government. You don't. He 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 never. And and generally, what you what 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 happens is you get a and you apply to a funding agency telling that I have I have to attend this conference. I have this. I have to present my finding. and the funding agency will ask you what is the what is the amount of um, I mean, what is the money you need uh, we'll give them a tentative uh, budget and they'll give you money and what happens is well, i have i've uh, um, i've heard from a lot of my students um, uh, and and friends telling that once you're back from the conference you'll have some money left out with you you can travel the world a scientist is actually a global uh, uh, i mean he is somebody who's accepted globally The, the 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 kind of where you have is international you keep traveling places next week you'll be listening to next month probably helena helena recently finished her history from canada this is what she told the reason why she she decided to choose a career in um uh, research is because she wanted to travel places she doesn't like being um you know held up to a place my my reasons were different and you can travel the world and of course most important thing you gather a lot of respect right you gather a lot of respect you you won't realize that you gather a lot of respect this is what you do for humanity um uh, is definitely noble right gather and 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 uh, why of uh, there's a reason why i've put it there um we being human beings we all need this kind of recognition and stuff so this is important you gather a lot of social respect society admires people who contribute to knowledge the society knows that what they do is what keeps humanity going forward so you gather a lot of respect a very important reason for you to pick up this career 
And the last thing I'll uh, I want to I would like to discuss here is the monetary part. How good is the pay? Right? Important question. All I want, would like to tell you is that you are not going to die a billionaire unless you are, I mean, of course, your ancestral property and stuff is different. There's a career in academics, a career in scientific research. Apart from all these attractive points, that's going to be noble, it's going to be immensely satisfactory. I'll tell you when you publish a paper, when your paper features in uh, a journal, the kind of satisfaction you get is unmatchable. If you, if you guys, some of you guys have written uh, poems or if you've written essays for magazines, you see uh, something coming in your uh, in the magazine, something uh, with your name coming in the magazines, the kind of satisfaction, happiness you get is kind of, you know, uh, it's it's a pure kind of happiness, right? So imagine your your article uh, being featured in a scientific journal, the National Journal. I mean, and and I I I actually live for that satisfaction. That's, that's the biggest kind of satisfaction I get. Um, I, it makes me happy for a month for more than that. I don't know. The happiness, uh, you know, uh, keeps me going. Uh, when it dies down, you, of course, have to publish another paper. That's difficult. It's not an easy, easy thing to do. Uh, but then, apart from this, you come to the monetary part. So you, you get decent money, support you and your family, of course. You don't get this lavish, you know, basically lavish money, because basically, as I told you, all this is done using common man's Tax money, government funds. So you don't you don't get to fulfill your necessary needs. I would say luxury. But then, of course, it's a career that will give you a respectable position in the society. You, that will make you really satisfied, and uh, you know you'll be serving the humanity, right? So with this, I think uh, I'll wind up. Um, before we move into the question session, um, this is Ansari Hostel. I hope you know this place, right? Uh, the name board came recently. I lived there uh, for around, you know, how many years? Like uh, five to six years I was there. I was an inmate, inmate of the Abram Hostel. Um, and this was a place where I grew up. Um, most important thing is, Abram, Abram, in and the other the and the Abarth and the Abarth Padikimbo, the Abarth cities are in down, Ashiri Marsh and down. The Abarth and intellectual ambience on Dairon. The Abarth Manaviga de Kurchu or another superficial itala. Ningala, even the Abarth and the Victor Matabala, Edangal and Pombo. Lai Dangalam, our Manaviga de Kurchum, Agri Kurchum, Ajivis Nehate Kurchoka Parib. The average other Anuboana Anubo Miniki Jivati on the Tala, Purga Pitika Rubatam, Mulingalan, Yamparnavale, Ne Logata Noki Kanam and Ditur Vikshanakon, a perspective, nor in the Ketu the Venda the Map perspective on a perspective of building in the Lab. The Abrathana Endagarathan, whatever value of Pangandan, Sundan Yampar, the Madangi Varanam. സംതൃപ്തിയും um, 
ഇങ്ങനെ ഇത് ഇന്ന് ഇങ്ങനെ ഞാൻ മനസ്സിലാക്കും കാരണം ഞാൻ ആദ്യം പറഞ്ഞ പോലെ ദയാപുരവുമായി ഞങ്ങളുടെ എല്ലാവരുടെയും എന്റെ മാത്രമല്ല ദയാപുരത്ത് ആ കാലഘട്ടത്തിൽ പഠിച്ചു പോയ എല്ലാവരുടെയും ബന്ധം വളരെ വൈകാരികമാണ് അതുകൊണ്ട് തന്നെ ഇത് ഇത് എന്നെ സംബന്ധിച്ച് ഭയങ്കര തൃപ്തി തരുന്ന ഒന്നായിരുന്നു താങ്ക് യു ഇനിയിപ്പോ ഇഫ് യു ഗൈസ് ഹാവ് ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻസ് ടു ആസ്ക് യു കൻ ആസ്ക് ആൻഡ് ഐ ഓൾസോ ബി ഹാപ്പി ടു ഹെൽപ് യു ആഫ്റ്റർ വേർഡ്സ് ഓൾസോ റൈറ്റ് ഇഫ് യു ഡിസൈഡ് ടു pick up this as your career option and if you want any 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 kind of guidance feel free to feel um, and contact me um you can collect the email id from your <coughs> a principal or teachers disha miss so guide and i am i'm very close to her we are you know in touch so you can get her get my number from her and you can call call me up directly so if you would like to ask me questions we can have some questions and then it up i think i took some 10 minutes extra uh, but i generally when i start talking i nane oru vaadu samayam adhigam edukkarundu pinne yan oru vidham samayam manage cheyidu so uh, any questions sir yes the institute can implement to improve the research instinct in a student mm, yeah uh, of course that's what um, i mean this this talk was basically um, um in uh, uh, a step in that direction if i'm not wrong because uh, i i was talking about why um, why research is a good career and and how to get into research career so connecting this kind of interactions and talks definitely builds the um you know, research interest in the students other things that uh, yeah probably we can think of as uh, like doing a workshop rather than just talking about how it is done we can have a workshop on how uh, you know manuscripts are written how um, research problems are identified um it's a, it's a popular misconception that uh, students of your age does not do not understand the method of research and stuff So that's a, a, a misconception in fact if if you get an opportunity to listen to people who, do, who does these kind of things you will definitely definitely pick it up you i mean um, because if if you if you guys can clear j uh, this uh, iit entrance exams and neat and stuff like that your you know, your intellectual capability is good enough to understand what is a method of science and how to build a hypothesis and stuff but schools gen- generally doesn't um think in the, the, this particular direction um but then this is kind of a good very good initiative if you want to take it further i i can bring in a very good people also i mean not just me um uh, to to lead discussions and help you out um you know uh, in in identifying research problems and maybe um writing a mock proposal for that matter uh, and also um Uh, yeah you can do stuff like that workshops more lectures and all uh, will help it help in uh, developing the research question yeah any, any other question sir yeah. so in the beginning you said that uh, most students are not willing to take up research or being a scientist as a career options why Correct. do the reluctance for students to do so ha huh, yeah um, i i i i think i have told that also the reason also see the most the most important thing is uh, you never you, you don't know what uh, what actually see the scientists as i told you uh, what we understand about a scientist is kind of a fancy imagination we have that's why that's because we we read books fictions no we see the scientist who is mostly um, you know uh, doing some creepy stuff he's creating some monsters who come out and that's that's a kind of impression that we get when we think about a scientist a monster who, who comes uh, i mean who, who uh, accidentally gets out of the lab and goes into the um, uh, you know uh, goes in, uh, into the people and then destroys everything and the scientist ultimately finding it difficult to bring him back and all that this is how we um, perceive um, scientists uh, generally especially when we are kids 
we, we read a lot of fictitious stuff and then we tend to think that this is what scientists do. No, actually scientists do things which are humanly possible. Okay. So uh, I think the reason why all those students, uh, I mean, all the kids, as kids, we tend to uh, show this sense of inquiry uh, and, and, and we tend to be you know, budding scientists. Later, it dies down because nobody tells you what exactly a scientist does and how to be one, right? For me personally, I never knew that uh, uh, you know, doing a PhD is possible until I finished my MSc. I'm, I'm being very frank. I never knew that there are competitive exams that one can take after MSc so that you will get a fellowship, a, a, a decent fellowship to do your PhD. I never knew that these kind of careers existed, academic careers existed. There are people who sit in research centers and work on you know, uh, scientific problems to come up with solutions. I never knew that uh, these kind of publication processes happen because I never asked this question, how does this is, does this textbook information come into existence, right? So it is lack of knowledge. I'll, I'll answer your question. It's lack of knowledge, lack of guidance, guys. Right? And also a kind of an obsession towards the conventional careers. Maybe that is because uh, I would say that is because uh, maybe uh, uh, because, you uh, know, the, the, we, we understand certain careers as socially well accepted, like being a doctor, being an engineer, doing um, doing your um, uh, uh, engineering in an IIT, all this is kind of considered fashionable, but uh, doing research in IISC, doing research in National Brain Research Institute of or National Institute of Immunology is not, not very popular, just um, uh, like studying MBBS in Calicut Medical College. That's, that's just because of ignorance, I would say, lack of awareness. So this this kind of a, a lot of these kind of talks and, um, and maybe you you have to listen to I told you um, I'm a half cooked scientist and half cooked um, uh, teacher uh, I can put you in touch with people who do full time research um, I I'll tell you about a person his name is Vinod Skaria Vinod Skaria um, uh, studied in Silver Hills School um, and then he. He qualified the NEET and then he did his MBBS from Calicut Medical College. And uh, after doing his MD, he felt that what he's doing, the, the profession is uh, not satisfying his intellectual capacity. And he decided to do a PhD from Pune University. He did his PhD from Pune University. And now he is working in um, Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology that is in New Delhi. He is the, he is the person who uh, you know, who has contributed a lot to understanding rare genetic disorders. Uh, I, I'll, I'll just show you one slide. If you get some time, uh, uh, please, uh, uh, I, I'll just show the slide, okay? I missed it, actually. Uh, is my uh, slide visible? Yeah? Yes, sir. Uh, so this is uh, you can you can Google it, uh, Google on it. Uh, this is kind of uh, the story of an Agra family, and uh, these you, as you can see in the image, uh, this person's six children. Now he, um, the reason why he had six children is like the first child was born, and then in another two to three years, the child showed um, paralysis and similar symptoms. Nobody, no doctors were able to figure out what is going wrong. And expecting that the next child will be okay, <clears throat> um, they tried again, and then they got the second child. The second child also, after three four years, developed the same symptom like that. Six children developed symptoms, and they, he never had a clue of what is going wrong. Okay, uh, he, and they belong to a community called as Nalband, uh, and nobody, no doctors were able to offer any sort of help because this was uh, this was quite unusual. The this kind of symptoms they developed, the kind of neurological, they basically develop a neurological a disorder and ultimately get bedridden. And then what he did is he uh, applied, uh, he petitioned to the Supreme Court of India asking permission to euthanize all the children, right? Asking permission to euthanize all the children because he was the only person who had who had to take care of the six kids, uh, six kids who, who were bedridden. He was not able to manage it. He wanted permission for euthanization and that is when his heroes stepped in 
uh, from IGIB, uh, the Institute of Genomics and Integrative Biology, uh, Dr. Shamsuddin, uh, Dr. Vinod Skarya and his team stepped in. Um, they spoke to the family, they collected samples, and they identified the reason for the disease. The cure was not, the cure, uh, there is no cure for the disease, but at least to give, give an explanation to people. It was not done by doctors, it was done by scientists. So interpretation of malady, how scientists zeroed in on one family's rare and crippling disease. So the Institute for Genomics and Integrative Biology led by um, very able uh, scientists actually helped to contribute to society by identifying you know, uh, vulnerability to these sort of diseases. So if you, <clears throat> you, you can make a note of this and then Google and find out how the disease was identified and how it helped uh, no, it, it gives hope to people when you have a disease and you don't figure out why the disease is happening. It keeps occurring in your family, you know, and, and then, you know, somebody is giving a, a solution. This is why it's, it's because of mutation happening in a particular gene. Um, so I, 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 um, the question I think is answered. Uh, basically, it is because of the lack of awareness of what scientists potentially do. And due to the impression that um, scientists generally do um, humanly impossible things. No, that's not like that. Um, uh, they do uh, humanly possible things. Yeah. Any more questions? Sir, is mm -hmm. a degree better than regular degree? Well, go again. Is? Sir, is integrated degree better than regular degree? Very good. Very good question. Yeah. Uh, I wanted to tell that. I wanted to talk about that. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, the, you, you, you get to do two kinds of integrated degrees. One is BSc integrated with MSc, and MSc integrated with PhD. So, um, uh, and, and the problem with this is, uh, I, I would say MSc integrated with PhD is a really, really good option. After you do your UG, if you're competent enough, and if you can clear some exams, like for example, uh, you would have heard about uh, Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, as in Trivandrum. Okay. Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology, for example, I'm, I'm talking about um, an example in Kerala. Um, so they offer integrated uh, MSc PhD programs, but you will have to clear an exam. After your UG, you will have to take an exam and clear the uh, exam and then get into this research institute. The advantage of that is um, we do this only if you're planning to take up a career in research because your MSc in, 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 in a normal college, um, um, uh, if you, if you enroll for MSc, it is going to be mostly theory classes with some amount of practical experience and stuff. But when you do an integrated MSc PhD, you are enrolling for MSc in a research institute like Rajiv Gandhi Center for Biotechnology. So you don't learn much theory. You will be working in a lab and you will be full, fulfilling the requirements for the degree. That is, you have to take exams and stuff. Mostly you will be working in lab. So the advantage is you get hands-on training on techniques and tools and how to handle, um, you know, experiments, how to un, um, infer results and stuff like that. So obviously, if your intention, but the problem is, yeah, of course, the number of seeds are um, uh, minimum, uh, very, very low. Like only few institutes offer this. Indian Institute of Science offers, National Center for Biological Sciences offers, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research offers, ISERs offer this, no ISER, right? All these institutes, all these premium institutes in the country, which is which has a focus on research offers integrated MSc PhD. The problem is your basics should be sound enough. Once you finish your degree, um, you, if your basics are good enough, you may be able to crack these exams and get in for MSc PhD integrated. And that's a really good option because as I told you, um, you will not be doing much of theoretical stuff. You will actually be working in labs uh, 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 and learning things. So it's kind of, it's going to, um, um, uh, improvise your uh, skills um, uh, manifold compared to uh, studying in a regular college. Yeah. So while pursuing your PhD, what all support you got from your friends, family and society? <laughs> yeah. Family, uh, friends, right. Friends, uh, friends are like whatever you do, they're okay, right? That is why we call friends, friends, right? Uh, you do PhD, okay, very good. You don't do PhD, okay, very good. Uh, family, yeah, it's 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 kind of a very uh, important question because 
convincing your family to do a phd is difficult actually especially for girls i am i mean although we uh, because uh, there are there are certain uh, societal uh, expectations right um, so doing a phd is kind of um, exercise that may take anywhere around uh, uh, four to seven years or maybe 10 years i know people who 10 years to finish their phd a friend of mine uh, currently in cambridge i was talking about 10 years to finish his phd uh, and, and and the societal expectations especially what parents expect from you uh, at a certain age i mean like every every age you pass there is there are certain kind of expectations this this uh, age is for this this age is for this if if you cross that age limit something very big is i mean it's it's really bad and all that uh, so uh, my parents basically uh, you know uh, they have always had given me enough freedom to decide what i want in life my parents were supportive um, family yeah that 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 is a case but uh, in some cases i have seen my my friends who struggle to convince fa- convince their families regarding doing a phd because mostly they don't understand uh, spending uh, five to six years of um, peak years uh, or, or important years on getting a degree after finishing your pg so that, that might not be very convincing enough um, i mean it is very difficult to convince parents on that but that is why i told you best thing is you clear some national level competitive exams and i told you there is a csir exam conducted by central government um and and they pay you really well like around uh, 40 45000 is the fellowship now that's that's the fellowship in the initial two years so if you're financially independent i mean this is a practical advice if you are financially independent uh, then convincing people uh, whoever it be, it may be it's not really difficult so uh, and 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 that's why the governments actually focus on increasing the phd fellowships remunerations on a um, I mean, regular basis when i started my uh, started getting my fellowship it was 16000 per month that's 30% uh, rent allowance now it is 35 plus 30% if i'm not wrong 35 plus 30% hra so uh, to my belief um, that is good enough to uh, take care of yourself yeah so once you are financially independent not relying on your uh family relatives parents for surviving yourself during the course of your phd then nobody sh- should have an objection right that's the best way to go um, about this and and then now i feel that the you know, parents are i mean the, the, the new generation parents generation has changed right so the, the parents are more uh, aware of uh, the advantages of doing phds and all that so in my case everyone were uh, really supportive anything else sir how to get into indian institute of science what are the admission requirements okay i'll talk about the phd requirements first i'm oh, sorry uh, the requirements to get into phd um first thing is um you have to have a msc in a subject in any subject like it could be engineering btech it could be it could be bsc in uh, um, any science subjects okay and uh, you should have 55 percentage of marks minimum that is uh, some basic uh, qualification uh, condition and then as i told you um you should have a fellowship okay what is this fellowship so as i told you there is this agency called as council for scientific and industrial research they conduct an exam twice every year after or you can take this exam only after your msc this exam is called as a net exam popularly known as the net exam national eligibility test basically this exam gives you a license to teach in an indian university the misconception is it is not just for teaching license okay so the, uh, i'll tell you the uh, generally they conduct the exam in the third on the third sundays of june and on the third sundays of december every year okay you cannot take the exam now you have to finish your msc 
they conduct it in four disciplines. Um, and um, the exam is kind of uh, difficult. It's not very easy. But if you have good basics, good, uh, if you studied your BSc and MSc um, well, then probably you'll clear the exam. And uh, once you clear the exam, if you, if you get somewhere around, say, uh, if you fall in between uh, 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 150 or 200, uh, you know, 200 rank, then um, you can enroll for PhD. Uh, I mean, you can go to IISC. Um, uh, you will have to take an interview, of course, but you you need not take any screening exam. Okay, you can directly go for the interview. Uh, and if you clear the interview, interview is not very difficult once you have this JRF certificate with you. Once you enroll, the first step is you have to register for PhD. They'll give you a registration. Once you register, you send it back to CSIR. You have registered under this particular guide in the Institute of Sciences. Next month onwards, central government will start remitting the remuneration amount to your account. Okay. This is one thing. Second thing is, second option of getting in is, if you don't clear JRF, IISC has its own exam, conducts its own exam every year for PhD candidates. You have to clear the exam, you have to clear the interview and get into IISC, and IISC will pay you the fellowship. The, the, prob, uh, uh, the problem is, uh, in, in IISC, you know, it's, it's a high-end place, so it's always better to qualify JRF and get into IISC you will feel a little confident that you have cleared the exam and uh, most of your fellow PhD mates will be having this JRF tag with them. So you shouldn't feel embarrassed and stuff. So it's always better to focus during your MSc on this, on clearing this exam, that exam and getting into these institutes, not just IASC. Um, don't uh, just because I have, I showed IASC to you. Don't think IASC is the only institute for biology, you have NCBS, National Center for Biological Sciences, which is a uh, which is a brand new research center, which is under the aegis of um, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research. For uh, NCBS is really good. NCBS is doing a lot of unconventional research, and there the way they conduct research, the way the scientists conduct themselves, all is all everything is different there. NCBS is. Early, uh, kind of, um, if you step into the campus itself, you'll feel that you are into some foreign country, uh, some institute in the foreign country. Yeah. So this is how you can get into IISC. Integrated MSc, all right. Integrated MSc also, you'll have to take a qualifying exam, and then you'll have to get it right. Any any more questions? Yeah, sir, besides JE and NEET exams, is there any other competitive or scholarship exams specific for research at the UG level? Um, is there exams? Is there, uh, that is Indian Institute of, um, what is ISER, guys? I know that's ISER, uh, Indian Institute of Science, Education and Research, right? We have one in uh, uh, Trivandrum, ISER Trivandrum. Mohali ISER is pretty famous. So ISER, I think they conduct exams for, for UG admissions also, if I'm not wrong, right? Most of these exams, most of these competitive exams happen after your UG. You have to finish your UG and then you can try for integrated MSc PhD or maybe integrated PhD. Oh, sorry, PhD alone, yeah. But you do check out the ISER uh, uh, thing. I think ISERs offer exams, yeah. Uh, for, uh, no, fellowships for UG studies, right? Uh, Dilip sir, I need to interfere a little bit because we no, have no overshot the time. Yeah. One last question by Jisha Miss. Oh, okay, sure. Hi, Dilip sir. Hello, ma'am. Uh, the queries we heard so far uh, from this, what I understood is uh, very in the future, we can expect a few uh, research scholars from the Yabram side. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'd be happy to see that, ma'am. Uh, if it happens, uh, would you like to serve as a guide for them? 
Yeah, yeah, sure, ma'am. Like, um, uh, uh, see, guideship is kind of, um, we, I have applied for guideship in Bangalore North University um, and it's under process. So I've already fulfilled the requirements for being a research guide. So um, in another six months, um, I'll officially, hopefully I'll officially be a, a approved research guide of North Bangalore North University where my college belongs. Um, and if that happens, obviously uh, I'm happy to, uh, taken students from Dayapuram, yeah. And Dayapurites will get the opportunities in big, big places. I know the kind of training that they get. I, I hail from the place. So uh, only thing is they have to be oriented towards these kind of um, non-conventional careers. Yeah. Okay, so thank you. And uh, I request Shemi to propose the official word of thanks. It gives me an immense pleasure to deliver a word of thanks for this event, especially to uh, Sir Dilip Francis, Assistant Professor, Department of Life Sciences, Sister Jaili College, for delivering his articulate lecture on promoting research application. Many young minds would now be ready to inquire and make efforts to uncover miraculous scientific facts. Thank you so much, sir, for this inspirational and influential session. No event can be successful without people who dedicate their resources and time to make sure everything is spotless. So I would like to thank our beloved principal, Jyoti Ma'am, and our management committee, along with all our Vati teachers, and my dear friends, thank you so much for making this session a grand success. Once again, I would like to thank one of our present here. Thank you. Have a nice day. Yeah, uh... Thank you. I, I also would like to thank uh, Adil sir um, and Jyoti Mas and Disha ma'am, uh, Rajiv sir, everyone uh, out there for, um, you know, uh, giving me this uh, opportunity. Um, yeah, thank you.